Hey, order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! One of the lesser noticed proposals in George Osborne's spending review last week was the decision to cut what's known as short money. It was introduced by the then leader of the House of Commons, Ted Short, in 1974. It was designed to help opposition parties more effectively fulfil their parliamentary functions. The bill for the taxpayer this year is £9.3 million. The amount each party gets depends on how many MPs they have and how many votes they got at the last election. So most of the money this year, nearly £5.8 million, goes to the Labour Party. And the SNP also get a sizeable chunk. They've received just under £1.1 million. So cutting taxpayer funding for politicians is bound to prove popular with many. But it hasn't gone down well with others, including the Labour Party and Shadow Commons leader, Chris Bryant, who joins us now. Hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, and you? <laughs> a lovely morning. <laughs> yes, we'll come on to that. We'll, we'll go back to that lovely no, morning no, in just a moment. A yeah, I thought you might want to. I mean, every part of the public sector is making a contribution to cutting the deficit, so why shouldn't political parties? Well, look, short money is there to make sure that um, the opposition, all the opposition parties, yeah. can do a proper job of scrutinising the government. So, for instance, just as the government has got the whole of the civil service and special advisers who are all political appointees and, you know, a budget to be able to go and visit um, whatever institution. So, for instance, the prisons minister can visit the prisons. Um, so, too, surely opposition um, port uh, portfolio holders, like the shadow ministers, mm. uh, um, prisons minister, should be allowed to visit sure. uh, prisons as well. But shouldn't and that there be a the... contribution from opposition parties well, or po political parties in general to tackling the deficit? I'd, 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 I'd be right behind that if it weren't for the fact that what the government has done in this same period is it's increased the number of special advisers who are all party political appointees. They've gone up from 79 to 103, an extra cost of £2.5 million every year, all, all going to Tory party members. And, at the, and, and George Osborne, um, has got ten special advisers. And they did say they would reduce that bill, and they didn't haven't. they? And they and, did it. In, and, they and said they... that in 2010, they didn't. But on principle, then, you wouldn't be against a reduction in the amount of short money to I, I'm opposition parties. I'm happy to see if, if, the ho if we're considering the whole cost of politics. But on top of that, the government's added £2.9 million a year by appointing um, more members of the House of Lords, 240 more members of the House of Lords, the mm. fastest any Prime Minister has ever appointed um, ministers, all, again, for party political coffers. Right, well, let's... And I think that that's a problem because in the end we have a constitutional settlement in this country which is that Her Majesty's loyal opposition and opposition parties play a vital part in making sure that the government does a good job. Right. It's wrong of the government single-handedly, unilaterally, to cut that money. You would say that you're in opposition. Of course, if you were well, to win in 2020, of course, you could say it would be the Tories no, that would have, no, would no, have well, less short money. No, but, but, well, Joe, they would. That's very unfair. Why? Because actually, when we were in government, we introduced it in the first place. And secondly, in 1997, when the Tory party thought it was down on its knees, it was never going to recuperate, we trebled short money. They claimed £45.7 well, million. Pounds. It... So it's quite one thing. We have been honourable in this, and the government is being utterly despicable and dishonourable. Oh, right. Well, despicable and, and dishonourable on the issue of short money for democracy's sake? I wouldn't go as far as to say that. I would say that we have cut back the civil service by about two and a half billion across the piece. So you haven't therefore, cut special advisers. Special though. advisers have not been cut right. as much should as they, they should have been. Should they they have gone, gone up. up. I accept the figures. Are you unhappy um, but about I, that? But I believe that overall we have taken the right decisions to reduce the, the cost of government. I think. People out there expect opposition parties to raise money to, to fund themselves to a degree. We had to do that when we no, were in but opposition. You didn't. You took 45 no, well, no, million but, pounds. but that doesn't actually fund the political party. You know, naturally, the Labour Party takes a great deal of money um, from from the trade unions, yep. and we get money from other sources as well. well I was going so, to say. So therefore, <laughs> but bankers. I don't. But I don't think people necessarily expect um, taxpayers' money to, to, to fund well, politics. That's, and, and that, that may be. But hang on. That, that may be. But why is is it that the number of special advisers, the number of paid appointments by the government has gone up if, if this Not government so. is so committed to trying to reduce the amount of money that is spent by taxpayers um, on this particular area? Why is it that we've seen large numbers of people appointed to the House of Lords? It's growing in some areas, uh, well, you might yeah, I mean, say. I, let, me, let me deal with a situation vis-à-vis -vis the House of Lords. When we actually came in, into government after 10, 12, 13 years of 
of Blair government, we actually had 28% of the members of the House of Lords. We Therefore, there is a really good oh, reason for the House of Lords no, to right, that, that, in some that's way. a good way of deflecting. You have a point so, 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 therefore, I'm not going to take Chris, it on the nose that we shouldn't actually bring people into the House of Lords. The Prime, to minister, the 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 Prime minister has appointed oh. ten times as many oh. barons since he became Prime Minister as there were at Runnymede in 1215. And yet he goes on about democracy. I, and I, he wants I'm to sure. cut the number of elected MPs yeah. but increase the number of I'm unelected sure I can politicians. bring in the figures <laughs> and, that Tony Blair produced. Is it bad for democracy? You so have no problem. Don't all shut up because nobody can hear you. So, Chris, you... Do go, go ahead. I'm I was just going to say one other thing, which is it, quite interesting. The government has decided there's also Cranbourne money in the House of Lords, which goes to opposition parties. It's decided not to cut that. And why is that? It's because they haven't got a majority in the House of Lords, so they're just going to let that carry on. It is utterly reprehensible the way the government is behaving. It's unconstitutional. I think there should be... And quite a lot of Tory MPs... I, um, to be honest, I think that Neil agrees. Uh, he's smiling. He is agreeing with me. I, he, he's going to go my, back my, and he's going to tell John... My lips are not moving, are no, they? Your lips no, are sealed, is the expression, but they're also... But your top moment. lip is sweating. All right. That means I think that you agree with is me. It, is it good for democracy, though, to have a fully you know, functioning opposition. Yes, it is. Right. And I, I think we're probably suffering from some of, the, of that at the moment. Well, let's, like talk, about, let's talk about the fully functioning opposition as it is. There's a damn shadow... You, there's damn a you, shadow damn cabinet. You, we left just enough time. Um, I knew we'd I've be disappointed otherwise. To, I think it's I might one of those to... hidden measures, Joe, like right, taking a million yeah. people off the electoral roll. Right. We don't get headlines in the same way as splits do. Well, before we move on insidious. to yet another subject, the shadow cabinet meetings at two, what will you be saying? Uh, well, it depends a bit on what Jeremy says. I, I personally think that it would be on my conscience, to be honest, if there were another uh, attack by ISIL on British targets, either in this country or overseas, like tourists, wherever, and we were not to have authorised the use of, use of lethal force against them, when a French socialist president is in yeah. favour, uh, when um, the whole of the United Nations is in favour, the international community is in favour, and when we're already bombing ISIL in Iraq... So is, is John so McDonnell right it should be conscience. a free vote? I'd prefer it to be a free vote, if but it's I want not, to hear... But... If it's not a free right. vote and Jeremy Corbyn says, I am the leader, no, I Jeff. will decide, uh, I am Jeff. whipping my shadow cabinet to vote against airstrikes, what will you do? Well, I'm not sure about whose decision it is, actually, to make. Sure. But um, I've had this conversation with you on this programme many times before. Hypothetical questions begin with the word if. Yeah, but and listen, I'm not the, going meet to. the meetings at two, and yes. every implication is no, and Diane Abbott and well, Diane Abbott, whom we talk to a lot as the sort of voice and representative, she Jeremy Corbyn said, and others has said it should be a whipped vote and a whipped mm -hmm. vote against airstrikes. And all I'm saying is, if that and is the case. Will you then but vote you, against? I, let's, let's go back, shall we? Every time you put the word if in, it becomes a hypothetical question. I want to listen to the leader of my party. He's elected with a massive mandate within, within the party. But I've expressed what my personal preference is and what my, my anxiety is, that if I vote against, in the end, if I vote against any kind of military action against ISIL, will I... You know, I mean, I had somebody send me an email earlier which said, couldn't we just appoint a negotiator to negotiate between ISIL and us? Well, that is just fundamentally naive, dangerously naive, and doesn't and leaves British people unprotected and insecure. So yes, I prefer it to be a free vote. If if Jeremy's going to vote, you know, is is ardent in one cape view, and obviously I I take a different view from him. Um, I hadn't come on this program to talk about that. No, I come to talk on, uh, about something else. And I, on the whole, I prefer to have that conversation privately in, in the shadow cabinet. But obviously, you've asked the question. And I've tried to answer it as straightforward. It feels as I like can. civil war at the moment when you're talking to the guests that we've even just had on today in Labour? Yes, yeah, so, well, uh, maybe it does, but I'm very focused on... It. Could I turn... You know, if, if a constituent of mine were on holiday somewhere or were in London and there was an ISIL attack mm -hmm. and they were killed, yeah. would I have failed in my duty by refusing to countenance military strikes. I know all the dangers that there are. There's mm. not a coherent plan. I'm not always convinced by David Cameron and all the rest of it. But in the end, would I have... Would I have failed that person? All right. Chris Bryant, thank you. Mm. We'll talk to you after the Shadow Cabinet meeting.